All right, so we did an unboxing. I gave some of my initial impressions on the DualSense controller for the PlayStation 5. Remember, this came out on the 30th of October, so just on Friday, whereas we still have to wait like a week and a half or so until the PlayStation 5 comes out. So that means we could tear this one down and check it out. I have another DualSense coming, so I don't mind ripping this one apart for science. We'll see what's going on in here. Not a big deal if, if it gets broken or something. Like I said, I have another one coming. Pretty confident we can get it back together, however, though. So I think this is gonna be a lot of fun to see what's going on inside of the PlayStation 5's DualSense controller. So if you guys enjoy this video, make sure you hit the like button down below. It helps out a lot. And if you're brand new here, hit that red subscribe button down below. So looking around the DualSense controller, it's pretty obvious that Sony did not want to have any screws really visible. And that's fine because that's just what Sony's been doing so far this generation, a lot of the accessories I'm looking at. Whereas with say the DualShock 4, there's screws right on the back of it. So it's, it's pretty obvious they tried to go the more sleek and modern route this time. But what that leaves us with is a question mark for how this opens up. Okay, let's talk about the first step when you open one of these up as I've just discovered. The front part comes off first, kind of the black part here. It's just one piece of plastic. This just kind of splits off at the top there, goes over the thumbsticks, pops off. That then opens us up to at least two screws that I see down here that are holding the two sides together. I was trying to figure out why this wasn't coming apart. I thought there was a clip up here. No, there are two, looks to be Phillips head screws right here on either side holding this together. So now I can unscrew those and then I guess the back will pop off. Okay, so we learned something here today and that is when you take this side off, there appear to be screws. This is really, really strange by the way. When I start to look at this after we get it all the way back apart, I'm gonna see if we can figure out how to take this apart better because the way I had to do it ended up breaking some of the plastics off at the top because there is a screw that is hidden way underneath of these shoulder buttons, which are lodged up right now because the plastics, it's underneath of here. So I need to, as soon as I get this side out and I unscrew that part, I just wanna take a look at how we would go about this if anyone needs to take their control apart so we can figure it out here. Like I said, I, I don't really mind really ripping this controller apart because we're gonna leave it, basically have it all in pieces. It was just a strange thing to see. Everything came apart fine until that top part right above the shoulder button. So I need to look at how we would go about getting that out. It's not really a huge deal because it's just some plastics and it should still attach fine and clip together. It's just a strange location to put some screws when you're trying to pull the controller apart. Anyway, if we look here, we do have our battery. This is a 1,560 milliamp hour battery at 3.65 volts. Still are unclear right now as to the battery life of this when hooked up to the PlayStation 5 and in use, but I have to imagine it'll be more than the DualShock 4, but we'll see because there is some pretty advanced tech inside of this controller. Good news is though, the battery itself does just detach. So once I figure out how to get the back off easier, if we do have issues with these controllers going into the future and we have to replace these batteries, you probably just have to order one and pop a new one and you should be good. It's also some extra room inside. There's a chance maybe we could get to the point where we have even larger batteries that go in because I know the DualShock 4 had something similar like that where you'd be able to upgrade to 2000 milliamp hour batteries and they actually extended the life pretty well. Now it looks like we have a screw here holding the black plastic behind it where the battery was sitting in. So we'll take this out. We do also have what appears to be a microphone that's plugged into the board here. And then this appears to be our reset button. So if anything goes wrong with the controller and you have to power it down or do a full hard reset, you would just press that there. After that screw comes out, however, it looks like we should have a look at the back of the board. We do. The microphone itself on the back, by the way, it just unplugs. So at least for this microphone, if you don't wanna have any of that, you can just unplug it and you don't have to worry about that microphone. We'll also take a look at the front microphone and see what we have to go through. Although I have a feeling this is it right here. This is, okay. So this is your front microphone. So if you are someone who just does not want a microphone 
on your PlayStation 5 controller. You can just unplug both of these and you should be fine. However, I would still have to test with the PS5 because who knows, having the, the different microphones unplugged could even stop this controller from connecting or maybe the PlayStation 5 kicks out an error or something. That's, that is something I can look into and maybe we'll do a full video after I have a better look with getting this back off and some pretty easy steps, hopefully. And we can just do a whole video on how to disconnect the microphones. So it does look like both of our adaptive trigger sets are just plugged in. We're gonna unplug those. The advanced haptic feedback motors are on either side. They are directly soldered to the board here and here. So we are gonna have to start unscrewing those to get those out now. We also have a cable up here. I assume that's our touchpad that's plugging into the board. And then that just kind of lifts up and flips around just like that. We have our speaker charging port at the top. The tactile buttons, which should be our option and create button are located here and here. The speaker, by the way, is just kind of held in with pressure. So it'll just sit like that. So if you do take this apart and get to this point, this may go flying on you, so keep that in mind. Looks like there were just two more longer silver screws that were that was holding the whole bracket together onto the front with that touchpad. At that point, we have this completely separated from the front here. This is our touchpad. It kind of floats around, which you feel that a bit because you want to be able to press down on it when you're when you're using it, which it looks like on this side, we can see all of our connections with the rubber membranes over here. These, like I said, are, were pretty quiet when you press down on them and they are a bit softer. By the way, these are screws that I'm talking about right here and here that, that were holding the plastics down. And now that I'm looking at it, I almost wonder if you can press R1 or L1 down and work a screwdriver in there to get that screw out. That might be how you have to do it. Oh, it also looks like R1 and L1 are pretty easy to reconnect. They just have some brackets here that just kind of fit together and it just presses down. So hey, if you do rip it apart like that, they at least go to back together pretty easily. I mean, it's still gonna fit back together fine. There'll just be, I guess, a slight gap right here, but it is weird because that right down there is where the screw would be and the button would just fill this up. So I don't know, that, that screw is hidden really, really well. So this is our advanced haptic feedback module that they're using in this. And it is quite a bit larger than what we have in the Switch Pro Controller. Those are kind of like small bricks that they have on either side. This is a very large motor that they have in here. And a lot of that probably has to do with just how large the space is, I guess, that they're trying to fill up on this. Because keep in mind, the handles on the DualSense controller are very, very large. I haven't actually been able to feel the haptic feedback in action yet, but this should cover the whole bottom of it pretty well. Also, they do a pretty good job sealing it. They have some tape here that sealed it. They also have a clip on the other side. So like this itself won't accidentally rumble around on its own. And that will kind of aid to the idea of it trying to have very precise rumble in certain spots. I also meant to take a look at the D-pad here and it looks like a Sony D-pad. Seriously, they've been using this design for a bit now. Obviously, we've seen it with the DualShock 4 for the last seven years or so, but even with like the PS3, the D-pads have always been pretty good on PlayStation controllers. So this is this is no exception. It has the good peg in the middle there, and then it has some almost like, like just pieces of plastic raising up each direction so that you do have good contact when you press down on either side. Also for the touchpad itself, we have a little button hiding right in here. And in order to make sure that you can kind of press it from either side and it always has some sort of pressure, they use like these, you see these like plastic arms here. Those line up with all of these pegs here. So this center one is responsible for pressing the button, but then just in case you're off to the right or the left, you have these to cre uh, create tension so that you can still press it without having hit, hit directly in the middle. Well, all that's left now is to pull one of these adaptive trigger modules out. They are in there pretty well. It looks like it's kind of clipped a bit and there might be one screw holding it in, but we should be able to completely separate it and take a look. All right, so the way it looks like they're supporting this, it looks like they have a couple of screws on the opposite side. Now keep in mind, they are going to create quite a bit of tension with a motor that is designed to fight against you as you try to press the trigger down. So they have to make sure that this is a very stable part of the controller or we could see some cracking and breaking on the plastics, but it looks like we had two screws holding that in there, which is, I mean, this is pretty serious. And there we have it. This is the uh, L1, L2 module. 
and this should be our adaptive trigger. So there were four screws total holding this whole thing together. And we also had a ribbon cable that runs down here. I assume that ribbon cable is just the button press itself for, uh, for this case, L1 and L2 when you press them down. I would assume that this, since it runs underneath of it, is just detecting the button press, runs this board. And then of course this board then runs to the main controller board. But after taking those screws off, this side wants to come off here. All right, so now we have an inside look at the adaptive trigger. Now, we do have a motor right here. This, as I was assuming, is the main thing that drives the idea behind these resistant triggers. So we have our motor right here. Now this spins this little gear right here. And from what I can tell, if there is nothing being sent to this or you've disabled the idea of, of the adaptive controller and the triggers, of course, in the options menu, this will not activate. So this piece right here will not move. It'll stay right where it is. In which case, the trigger itself is free to be pressed normally. Now, the way that this works, so let's say you're playing a game and there is a bow that you have to, you have to kind of pull back and they want it to just always be filled with tension. Like it is hard from the start to the end of that bow, uh, that bow pull. This piece right here will then be spun up by our motor. So we can see this kind of moves up here. You can see that spinning. That would be the motor kind of spinning this and then moving this guy up. This then runs into our adapt our trigger here that turns into the adaptive trigger. And as I press down, you can see this moves back. So the idea here is the motor would probably continue to have some slow amount of resistance, kind of still continue to slowly wind it or be kind of in place like this so that you'll be stuck or having a really hard time pressing down and eventually get to the bottom. Maybe if it locks in place, it just seizes up, it just stops, and then you can't press anymore. So if I'm like this and it sticks and I can't press anymore, but if I let go, I can all of a sudden start to press. It is a really clever design. But let's talk about the big drawback and that is the idea that this could be broken. And you know what? Yeah, it can be actually based on the materials they're using. So let me give you an idea of this. We have all teeth in here, right, for all these gears. It's all plastic though. And my concern is if they decide to lock and you, you just don't feel like putting up with it that day, you kind of chip one of these teeth or just over time it wears down. And unfortunately, these teeth cannot grab any longer. And the overall idea for an adaptive trigger goes out the window. Now that of course remains to be seen. We don't know if that's gonna happen, but I have to tell you dealing with all plastics and of course we're gonna deal with millions and millions of these controllers out here. I wouldn't be shocked if the first run of these controllers and these adaptive triggers need a bit of tweaking in R&D after they see how everyone responds to them in games. But from like an engineering standpoint, this is a really cool idea to fit in to a trigger in a controller. I mean, we've been dealing with triggers the same way pretty much for a while now. We had the analog triggers, that was cool. We got like the kind of the rumble motors inside of the triggers, yeah, that's kind of neat as well. But like now they're actually manipulating the press itself. And that should give us a lot of cool gameplay ideas and things that developers will do, hopefully. If they decide not to use it, however, it's pretty easy to just turn it off at least and that just sits at the bottom and then it's just a regular trigger. But the idea of this just being there and them coming up with this solution R&D is really cool. Anyway guys, that's gonna do it here for the DualSense controller. I think I'm gonna play around with the adaptive trigger a bit more, check it out some. So I'll probably leave this apart for a little while and I'll even get some better pictures of this so you can have a really good look at it here and I'll probably post some of it on Twitter while I'm at it. But the DualSense controller, as expected, is high quality. It's a solid controller inside, and that's not really any surprise as a first party controller for a flagship device from Sony for their next generation game console. But I do still have a little bit of a concern around the overall longevity of the adaptive trigger itself. I mean, the controller can still function without it, but I do wonder what happens if a 
some of these teeth get worn down or broken inside of the controller itself and it attempts to stop you from pressing it or even slow the press itself. But let me know what you guys think about the DualSense controller here. I'm gonna also look into removing the back of it better as well. While it still works and it'll still go back together, I'm sure with this missing the front part, I'd like to get it down to where it's very easy to remove and those screws that were kind of hiding something I need to kind of look into a bit more myself. That way, maybe we can do a video where I show you how to just completely remove the microphones if that's what you'd prefer. Thanks guys for watching and I'll see you next time.